But we begin tonight with the closing arguments of two very different campaigns. For the Kamala Harris's for the Kamala Harris's uh, campaign, part of the closing argument has been to bring out some of the biggest stars in the world, but also some of the best advertisements for the American dream to help her make her case that it's time to move America forward. And she's upping that ante tonight with a hairdresser's daughter who became the biggest star on earth. Of course, I'm talking about Beyonce, who will perform in her hometown of Houston to hype up the beehive to vote. That's what the Harris that's what the Kamala Harris Tim Walls campaign is doing, including last night in Georgia. She's running to be the 47th president of the United States. Donald Trump is running to be an American tyrant. You already know what time it is. That we don't have a moment to lose. We want to stop that other guy. I don't call him by his name. I call him Agent Orange. We've seen that horror show before. And there's no way, no how, we gonna make America great again. We are not going back. You want to hear something about an American dream? Fort McPherson was once a Confederate army base where there were Confederate soldiers trying to plot and plan on how to keep 3.9 million Negroes enslaved. Now that land is owned by me. Boom, that last bite by Tyler Perry is about as good a depiction of the American dream as you are going to get. Perry, one of Georgia's most important residents, I suspect, even to that state's Republican governor, has survived poverty, even living in his car at one point, to become an actor, comedian, producer, and filmmaker who a few years ago was able to buy that 230-acre former Confederate military base and turn it into the biggest, most important movie studio in the eastern U.S., making Atlanta the Hollywood of the East Coast. Bruce Springsteen's father was a day laborer in Freehold, New Jersey, yet his working class son became one of the most important singer songwriters in the history of the music industry, who has maintained his authenticity by repping the heart of blue collar America for decades. Spike Lee's father was a jazz musician. He grew up in Brooklyn, New York and attended historically black Morehouse College. He's one of America's most important filmmakers. His movies have illuminated everything from HBCU life to the killing of black men and racial incidents in New York to the life of Malcolm X. Samuel L. Jackson was born two years after Donald Trump in Washington, D.C. But unlike Trump, who was born rich, Jackson's grandparents were from Chattanooga, Tennessee. He was a young activist in the black power movement in the 1960s and is also a Morehouse man. He moved to New York City and became a prolific stage actor who even survived drug addiction to become one of the biggest, most badass and iconic stars in the world. And then, of course, there's Barack Obama, a man who also came from humble roots, an African immigrant father and white mom from Kansas raised largely by his grandparents in Hawaii. But through his brains and determination, he made it to the top of the Harvard Law Review, to the Senate, and then to becoming the first black president of the United States. Kamala Harris herself is the daughter of immigrants from Jamaica and India, who also went to an HBCU, Howard University, and won an improbable race to become the San Francisco DA, then another to become the first black attorney general of, uh, attorney general of California, then a U.S. senator, and then the first woman vice president of the United States. And now she's the Democratic nominee to be the president of the United States. We here understand we have an opportunity before us to turn the page on the fear and divisiveness that have characterized our politics for a decade because of Donald Trump. We have the opportunity to turn the page and chart a new way and a joyful way forward. This group of Americans, descendants of slaves, sons of the working class, a daughter of the middle class, none coming from money or from the ranks of the elite, all of whom achieved the American dream. If you want to know why people all over the world want to come here to this country and have looked up to America, that's why. It's the possibilities and the opportunities this country uniquely offers despite the challenges of being a multiracial democracy. That's why my parents immigrated here. And yet, here again, 
is Donald Trump's closing argument about America. They're coming from 181 countries as of yesterday, right? And we're a dumping ground. We're like a, we're like a garbage can for the world. That's what's happened. That's what's happened to us. We're like a garbage can. First time I've ever said garbage can, but you know what? It's a very accurate description. A garbage can. Donald Trump describes America, a country that has given him more than he deserved, including a presidency he had zero qualifications for, as a garbage can. Donald Trump's grandfather, Friedrich Drumpf, came to this country from Bavaria, a.k.a. Germany, in 1885 as a 16-year-old draft dodger. He bought the one-way steamship tip ticket in order to avoid compulsory military service in his home country. That is an example that his grandson, Cadet Bone Spurs, would later follow to keep from serving in Vietnam. Among the jobs the teenage coward wound up doing here in America were working as a barber and allegedly as a pimp, running a saloon where he rented female prostitutes to gold prospectors since he had failed as a gold prospector himself. He eventually invested in real estate in New York, married a fellow German, and tried to go home. But Germany stripped him of his citizenship for draft dodging, and he returned to the U.S. for good. Lucky us. His middle child, Fred, was Donald Trump's father. Fred inherited New York properties from his father and built his real estate, his real estate empire by becoming a slumlord in Queens, New York, taking advantage of generous tax incentives while also being a prolific tax evader, best known for buying up and ruining Coney Island. He used to lie about his German heritage, pretending to be Swedish so he could do business with Jewish New Yorkers while getting sued by the Nixon administration for refusing to rent apartments to black New Yorkers. Donald Trump's mother, born Marianne McLeod, was an immigrant, too, from Scotland. She was working as a maid when she met Fred, but pretty soon, with Fred on her arm, she was sporting fur coats and jewels while refusing to let her own nieces and nephews have free access to the coin laundry in the buildings the Trumps let them live in, and sometimes withholding heat, according to her niece, Mary Trump. And then there's Donald, a man who was born with $317 million in the bank, who, after Fred helped him get into UPenn and then handed over his real estate empire, promptly lost $900 million on bad real estate and casino investments. He was saved by Russian money and then by Mark Burnett when he was dead broke, but a good enough performer to land a job as the star of The Apprentice on NBC. And that fame, despite his having actually no actual skills, convinced enough Americans that he should be president that he defeated a former first lady, U.S. senator and secretary of state, Hillary Clinton, despite losing the popular vote by three million votes. He and his family have done nothing but grift off this country. They stole and took and have given nothing back. Trump and his adult sons are banned from doing business in the state of New York for committing charities fraud. They didn't pay taxes and scammed the state to the point where Trump now owes the state of New York nearly $500 million. Donald Trump has a lot of effing nerve calling this country a country that has given him every undeserved benefit a mediocre, garish, tacky, creepy sex pest, whiner, and felon could possibly imagine. A garbage can because of immigrants who, unlike his cynical, sociopathic immigrant family, have actually given this country something in return. Joining me now is Tim O'Brien, senior executive editor of Bloomberg Opinion and Democratic pollster Fernand Amandi. Thank you both for being here. And Tim, if I missed something great that the Trumps <laughs> have contributed to America, you are a biographer of Donald Trump. Please, please fill us in. Well, I, you know, I actually want to point out that also he had two wives who were immigrants uh, in that list of, you know, immigrant connections to the world of Donald Trump. Um, you know, he if, if anyone had told him that uh, his his two of his wives were infecting the country or were vermin or uh, were garbage cans, uh, he obviously would have been insulted and he would have taken action, strong action against those people. But he has no trouble getting up on a national stage as a Republican candidate in a party that at one point 
said it wanted to embrace tolerance and expand the Republican net to include more people of color and more immigrants in the party, uh, to completely redefine it in the most ugly, sensationalistic, and damaging of terms. And, 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 and he's a man who also made his bones professionally and politically in the city of New York, which is not a perfect city. It's got its warts. But if there's any city on the planet that has tried to make tolerance, diversity, and a melting pot work, it's New York. And he self-identifies yeah. as a New Yorker. And it's one of the reasons New York has disowned him, is because mm -hmm. at his core, he's a, he is a profound racist, and he doesn't hesitate to try to insinuate that the country would be better off if it had less diversity and if migrants went somewhere else.